Garrett invited me to preach today. So uh, we're going to Acts chapter 6. I have been so struck by the life of Stephen in the book of Acts for three years now. I remember unpacking this text with our new church. Before we even planted, we were in like the launch phase. And we went through this text. This is the kind of church we want to be. These are the kind of human beings we want to become. Um, because he's, he, Stephen is a typical person, totally regular guy in many ways. Uh, unassuming, you wouldn't think he'd have the life he ended up having. Local church leader, elected by the people to a position of leadership. Um, his job description, you guys, you know what it was? Serving the elderly people food. Just a humble job in the church, but he went on to have this extraordinary life. And Luke dedicates almost 10% of the book of Acts to this guy's story, okay? Um, so for our time together, I'd like to look at four things we're going to pull out of this text. We're going to read the first part of chapter 6, but this uh, teaching is going to cover chapter 6 and 7. But we're just going to read the first part of chapter 6, and then we'll pray. So if you can, Acts 6, verse 1. I love that you all have your Bibles. It's a good sign, healthy sign. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Timon, or Pumbaa, I don't know, Parmenas and Nicholas, uh, from Antioch, a convert to Judaism, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Let's keep reading to the end of chapter 6. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Love that. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we've heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place, the temple, and against the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. This guy is a rabble rouser. It's up to no good. And then finally, verse 15, all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Um, I'd love to know what that looks like. I have no idea, but that sounds incredible. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now, would you grant us the Holy Spirit's power so that we might uh, receive your word and be changed by it? Illuminate our minds. Lord, you've inspired, you've inspired the scriptures uniquely among all other books. You've inspired the 66 books of scripture. Breathe them through authors for us. And now we need you to breathe on us to illuminate our minds, to hear and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so um, if you were to sit me down and say, okay, Evan, like, what, what are three or four things you want for, for like, your church in the next decade? I would go to Stephen. And I would pull four things out. And we're going to put them on the screen. Not yet. But um, so things that would mark the lives of every person who calls Park Hill Church home. And I would, I, I would bet Garrett would want these things to mark Fervent Church. Um, and there are four things from Stephen I think are fantastic. But first, a little bit of context. You guys, if you've read the book of Acts, how many of you have read the book of Acts? Fantastic, incredible history of the first church. Holy Spirit gets poured out in chapter 2, right? 
Church is born, miracles happen, Holy Spirit's here, the long-awaited prophecy has come. Extraordinary things are happening. This new community is forming, a lot like this. It's a new community. We feel that here. And there's financial generosity that's starting to trend upward. New leaders are being established just like here at Fervent right now. I'm sure Garrett has like all kinds of dreams about different leaders and the pipeline and praying for groups. This is, this is the ethos. This is the vibe. Uh, right now, and, and you'd think there would be no problems because the Holy Spirit is like f the fresh character on the scene, right? You'd think there'd be no problems, but then the next, ch in chapter five, very troubling chapter, the Holy Spirit literally kills a couple people for lying to the apostles about how they use their money, okay? Um, and I think God was saying to the church, I don't want you to mess up the economy of grace that I've got going here. And then Acts 6, there's squabbling and fighting. There's racial tension in Acts 6, like we just read. This is a generous church, and yet there's ethnic tension going on in this brand new Holy Spirit-filled church. So what does that tell us? Holy Spirit revival doesn't mean everyone's problems are miraculously solved, right? New church plant, first year, all the jitters and hype and buzz, it doesn't mean there's not like stuff to work on. Um, so. Uh, if Fervent Church hasn't found that out already, you will. So in our passage, the elderly women are experiencing a problem. There's tension between the culturally Jewish Christians and the culturally Greek Christians. So there's an intercultural tension going on, and they solve this problem by finding some Greek guys to help. All these guys have Greek names, and Stephen is one of them. We don't know much about him. We know he's a normal guy just living his life. What do you think he would have thought at this moment? elected by the apostles. It's like, what, that's a, me? It's create the new church, this new fulfillment of prophecy, this church, and I'm elected to serve. That's why I love this passage. You guys, I said it already. Normal guy, normal girl, normal people. That's who Stephen represents. He's not some alpha leader. He's not just dripping with charisma like Garrett, you know? Um, you can't, you can't hold him up and say, look at this guy. He's planted like five churches, been all over the country. He's one of the apostolic founders. That's not Stephen. It might be Garrett, which it is. It's awesome. Because the typical person who comes to church tends to think, I'm not the Apostle Paul. I'm not that church planner guy, right? Um, I have a regular job. I like commute. That's me. So like, I got, I got stuff I got to do. Why are you using all, the, all those people who are so holy as your sermon illustrations? Um, I, can, I can never be like that. Well, that's why Stephen is so fantastic. Do you think if there's, do you actually come to church on Sunday here and you walk in the door going, I think if there's a problem that arises, I might be elected to help serve. Is that how you walk in? Stephen's testimony says you can walk into church like that. You can walk into church going, I wonder what God has for me and what position and what place that he wants for me. Maybe, maybe I'll be called on to, and be raised up. So my secret agenda today is I want everyone in this church to be thinking, oh, Stephen did that? That's great. I, I, and I can do that. I can do that too. I hope the Holy Spirit fills me. I could totally do stuff like that. That's my secret agenda, which is not secret anymore. So, uh, so first thing from Stephen's life, first thing right on the screen. This is what marked him as a normal guy. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Simple, this is not rocket science. If you've been in the church for very long, you've heard that phrase. He was filled with the fullness of God. So uh, my prayer for you, would this be the year you resolve in your heart? I, fervent church member, want to understand who the Spirit is, what he does in the life of a believer, and what it means to be filled with him. So let's resolve in our hearts. 2021 is the year of the Holy Spirit for us personally. This is the year I figure out what that means for me. Look at Acts 6, verse 5. It says, this proposal pleased the group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit. There it is. So the distinguishing factors of choosing him were what? His faith in Jesus and his fullness with the Spirit. Short resume. Not a long resume. They weren't like, oh, Stephen, he's an exceptional citizen or whatever. No, they, were, they didn't look at his portfolio. He's a normal guy elected to servant leadership, but his, marked, his, his life is marked by the Holy Spirit. And it says later again, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs. 
And then later again, they could not resist the wisdom that the Spirit gave him to speak with. Normal guy, okay? So I want you to think of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. Like, like if you stopped on some of those and thought, have, have you been just dripping with the fruit of peace this year? Have you been just like, oh, I'm so content with my level of self-control this year? You have no idea the joy I wake up with every day. I never wake up at 2.30 a.m. like without joy in the morning. Um, think of the fruit, like the fruit, that's the sign that he is active and present and has you, okay? So, so how much of those things are present? If these things are not present in your life, just like they're not present at mine, in mine all the time, then knowing that the Holy Spirit is a promise from the Father, ask yourself, why am I not receiving that promise? Why am I not receiving that promise? If the Holy Spirit is a promise from the Father, and the Holy Spirit comes in and bears these fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, why am I not experiencing them? Why am I not receiving that promise? The Holy Spirit is a gift, not earned. So ask yourself, how do I posture myself this year, 2021, in order to receive more of the Spirit's fruit and work in my life? He's a gift that takes normal people and turns them into someone like Stephen. And this is what marks Stephen's life. So that's my prayer for you. Where you just say, in the quiet of your own heart, maybe tomorrow, Monday morning, you're like, Lord, I want to figure out this year with my community, with my leadership, what does it mean for me to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Let me say something. (laughs) You are not destined to just grind out another 30 to 50 years. It's not just you with the same habits and tendencies and life patterns, and then you just go to heaven when you're dead. That is not what God has for you. God offers the Holy Spirit to change you. The Holy Spirit can take a normal life, normal human life like you, and fill us with himself, and remarkable things can happen. Uh, I'm reminded of this story from this New York entrepreneur named Jesse Itzler. I read his biography. Um, I think it's called Living with a Seal. He literally uh, met a Navy SEAL while in San Diego doing an ultra marathon, which was a 24-hour run around Balboa Park. I don't know why people would ever do that, ever. Not filled with the spirit. Um, <laughs> but but he, he's, just, he's kind of a go-getter. Navy, he's kind of an entrepreneur guy, this Jesse Itzler guy, and he meets this Navy SEAL who's also running laps around, I think it was the zoo parking lot in San Diego. And... Um, And Jesse had a team, it was like a relay, so you didn't have to literally run the whole time yourself, you can tag, but but this seal, just this big black dude, he ran the whole 24 hours. No no tag team. And so Jesse's like, who are you? What, what, how can I get more of you in my life? Like, how do I, how can I, actually, can you move to New York? I'll put you up in a really nice flat. You train me, live with me for 30 days and I'll do whatever you say and make me like you. And he's like, um, he goes, okay, so I'll, on one condition I'll do that. You literally have to do everything I say or else I'm gone. I take all the money because you're paying me up front. Um, and he's like, hey, cool, how, how bad can that be? And uh, so, so he, he goes through it and it's horrible. I'll spare you the story. Um, total insanity. Things like, you know, running half marathons in eight degree weather in Central Park and just incredible cold plunges and like beyond the arctic circle and uh, after running and it's amazing what he does and this is what he says at the end of his experience the navy seal taught him quote when you're absolutely physically done and you've hit the wall you're actually at 40 percent of your physical capacity you have no idea of what you are capable of so by the end of this thing he's doing a thousand push-ups a day he finds his next ultra marathon has a minute and a half shaved off a mile every his pace. And it makes me think, like, who would, it, I'm reading this biography, and I'm like, who would I want to live with me for 30 days and train me? And then I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm a pastor, whatever, I think of sermons. I'm like, what, what if, what, what would it happen to my discipleship if Jesus Christ, like the Jewish Jesus transported from AD 32, and if I transported him to live in my address in San Diego, and I'm like, tell me, I'll do whatever you say for 30 days. You say it, whatever. Um, and then I'm like, uh, just 
oh my gosh, I do have Christ through the Holy Spirit living in me every day. I just must be asleep. So what would my life be like if I spent the month of January 2021 consciously saying, you know what, Holy Spirit, you and me, 30 days, and then 60. You and me, whatever you tell me to do, I know I'm nowhere close to my spiritual potential. I want to be built on you. I see what you've done through church history and through the stories of scripture, so here's my life. Maybe I'll do a 30-day experiment and see whatever you say, Holy Spirit. Wouldn't it be amazing for all of us to wake up and realize we have something way better than a Navy SEAL living with us and in us to shape us after Christ's vision of who he sees us becoming? So let me tell you something. If, If you, in your heart, have determined, I'm just not that great at following Jesus. I'm kind of like a cruiser. That's just who I am. I see other people doing, like, level this stuff, but I'm, I'm just always here because I keep doing, like, this stuff. So, like, I bump up on good days or whatever. If that's you, um, then you are nowhere near your full spiritual potential. You are not done. You are not done. The Holy Spirit can fill your life and change you. So one dream that I know your leadership has for you this year is that you'd say, I am living full contact with the Holy Spirit this year. Full contact. He's waking me up in the morning. He's putting me to sleep in the morning. (laughs) I'm doing whatever he says. Um, Total obedience for you. And I just want to see what he does in my life. I just want to see what he does. So that's that's the first thing. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. Second thing, they move quicker now. I spent most time on the Holy Spirit one. Second thing from Stephen's life, he was, he, he had theological depth. He knew the Bible, you guys. He knew the Bible, theological depth. Some of you, when I mentioned filled with the Spirit, maybe your church background is like, oh, that's weird. That's wacky, like hanging from the chandelier stuff. Um, And you might be like, oh, all those Holy Spirit people who don't know the Bible, they get wacky, and they get visions of like colors and wheels and stuff. And so is Fervent Church getting weird now? No, I want to challenge you. When you look at the life of Stephen, you see integration between the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures. You see remarkable integration between both. He's performing incredible signs and wonders. And he's full of grace and power. And then did, if you've read chapter 7, it's a deep biblical theology sermon that he lays down in front of the Jewish leaders who were putting him on trial at the time. Just rich with knowledge of the story of God in the scriptures. And, and we didn't read chapter 7, but it's powerful. And, and he is arguing against the experts in the Bible. And he's just a serving elderly people food deacon guy. Or is he? He's full of the Holy Spirit and full of biblical depth, this guy is. He goes after Israel's misconception about their nationality. He's like, Israel wasn't just for Israel, you guys. I know you're all pro- super Israel people, he says to the, to the Sanhedrin. He's like, but guess what? Israel is for all nations. It's not just supposed to stop with you. It's supposed to bless all nations. And then, and then he says, the temple is not just your special domain. The temple is actually, God has left the building and has become a person. And now the temple is where all his people gather and worship wherever they are. Did you know that, Bible experts, he says to them? So he's literally schooling them in their own game in this moment while they think he's on trial. So Stephen's so compelling in this that they actually kill him. <laughs> That's what a good teacher he is. He's such a good teacher, he's so, he's so, he's totally got them beat that they kill him. That's a persuasive sermon, you guys. And it produced incredible fruit. Now, now picture the scene too, it's ironic in this book of Acts. I'm wondering what the apostles are doing during this speech because the apostles are like, you guys go wait tables, we're gonna give ourselves to the word. Meanwhile, this table waiter is just breaking down the word. It's powerful what's going on here and he's just a normal, guy. So let me say this to you, Fervent Church. It'd be amazing if this year was, for you, the year of the fullness of the Spirit and profound theological growth. Like, here's here's a starting place. Read the Bible in a year. Have you done that? Read the Bible in a year. There are so many apps for that now. It's amazing. (laughs) Like, you almost need an ex- you almost need, like, a really good excuse not to read the Bible in a year these days. By the way, the best thing out there I've seen, thebibleproject.com, they have a reading plan and cool animated videos to help you understand the themes. It's amazing. It's changed our house, my family and kids. 
So why not make this the year you grow, theological depth? Just don't be, I say this in love, don't be one of those people who ends up in the middle of your life like you, you, you quote a random paraphrased Bible verse and you're like, it's, the Bible says somewhere, you know? <laughs> like, I don't know where the Bible says, it's in there somewhere or whatever. No, like, let this be the year you know where it is in the Bible. Like, how about that? That's awesome. It's not just for the sake of having biblical knowledge, but it's so important to know who God is to know who God is. And we can have this misunderstanding in our hearts that God is boring. We're like, I've heard this a lot. I'm just not like a theological mind. I've heard that. I don't know if you've heard that. I don't get nerdy about theology. It's not really my personality. But listen, theology is just another word for your God thoughts. When you do just a little bit of study into this collection of books, just a little bit, behind the authors and and their life context, and how they were the oppressed, and how they were prophetically crying out to the oppressor, and how some of them were kings who were being torn down from their thrones of arrogance. And when you read these stories, it's like, my goodness, it will boggle your mind what God has revealed about himself. So I, I don't know if it's the same in Colorado Springs, but in San Diego, it's pretty rare to find people who are full, like operating 10 out of 10, life in the spirit, and hungering daily for the scriptures. It's pretty rare. Those things ra- rarely go together because often people who pursue the fullness of the spirit, like Holy Spirit, break in, um, they're, always, they're often like, I don't need to go in deep into theology, that'll just make you prideful or whatever. And people who are really into theology get freaked out when the Holy Spirit shows up and starts like doing stuff, you know? But, but Stephen has both. Stephen's fully integrated here. So let this be the year of the Holy Spirit and the year of theological depth. Just something like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to own Ephesians this year, whatever that is. Like, get a couple commentaries. I'm just going to own that book. I'm going to know it inside and out. Be able to tell it to my grandkids. I'm going to own it. Or whatever. Let's resolve in our hearts, this is the year of the Spirit and scripture to me. In our church, we have a lot of young people, and I even suggest, half jokingly, but I suggest we even have like dating standards <laughs> as, part of, as part of the requirements. Like you have a scale of theological depth, like okay, this guy's incredible, successful, he's taking care of himself obviously, but he's only a two in theological depth, swipe away, whatever. But um, I think we need categories for that, but whatever. Uh, so the third thing, for, for the third thing from Stephen's life, third and fourth, the third and fourth are intention. You need both or else you'll, you'll, you'll miss the whole thing. So the third is courage to speak truth. Courage to speak truth. We are living in a culture that is dominated by the PC crowd. Political correctness. And it is killing us. Um, it's, it's killing us. Look at Stephen, Acts 7, verse 51. After his epic sermon on the history of Israel and the purpose of the temple and how Jesus fulfills it all, he says in verse 51 of chapter 7, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And then he goes, was there ever a prophet your ancestors didn't persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered Jesus. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. How much courage did that take? Stand before the official religious authorities and rebuke them while you're technically on trial. Incredible amount of courage. One of my great concerns in our culture these days is that we, we just live in a time when nobody has courage to speak truth and everybody ultimately wants to be liked. Because it's important to be liked. We're wired to be liked. We're wired to be told by God that we're worthy and we uh, are made worthy by his love and that we are beloved children of his. We're wired to be loved. And so it's natural that we take that wiring and spread it out into culture and the algorithms behind social media give us a like and we get that tickled or whatever. How, wherever that works for you in your social circles. Listen, a lot of you don't know me and believe me, I absolutely care about people's stories and I believe everyone's story matters. But if we are going to lead 
in the church in any capacity. We cannot be driven by narrative authority. We have to be driven by biblical authority. When biblical authority confronts our narrative authority, our personal stories have to bend to God. If, if not, then we're saying, in essence, I'm God. I appreciate the Bible, but I'm my own Bible. I appreciate Jesus, but I'm my own Jesus. And this goes for whether it's a conversation around sexual ethics and gender studies, or it's a conversation around political engagement and how to actually take the kingdom principles of Jesus and apply them to the American scene. It goes for both. We have to be careful. Jesus doesn't become that really supportive friend who just affirms whatever I do. Maybe Jesus doesn't agree with me about everything. Maybe he has a rebuke for me. I think a lot of us, what we've ended up doing with our, with, with our understanding of Scripture is we take one or two scenes from Jesus' life that we really like, and, and not normally the ones where he's like rebuking the religious people, because we never self-identify as the religious people. But we always find someone being bullied, and we get the victim mentality, and we see Jesus being nice to the one being bullied, and we take those scenes, lift it out, and form our own little lens to read the whole Bible. And we read the whole Bible like that Jesus is just... This, you know what I mean? And so we actually have a God of our own making at that point. We don't want to be like that. We want to be people who have courage to actually confront with truth. And of course we do this in love. I'm not talking about being a jerk in any way, especially entering a conversation you know is a non-starter. No desire for that whatsoever. But if you're not being loving, you are not being loving when you just baptize people's opinions and call that truth. That's not loving. And we need a vision for this. And I know it's hard. How many of you feel super great about conf- confronting people? Like, oh there's, oh, there's a brother or sister in sin. I got this. Like, doesn't, that's not, if, you, if that's you, that's actually probably a bigger problem in the church if you're stoked to be that person. Um, I, I'm suspicious of that person. But we have to do it. We have to have a heart and willingness to do it. This church is only, what, 15 months old. As communities and relationships get tighter and stronger, they have to also create environments of trust where you can say, all right, here, this is not in line with the way of Jesus. And you know me. You, I know you. We know we love each other. Like, so I can say this. And I hope you say this to me. And this is why I love the Navy SEAL guy. It's like, either do what I say or what's the point? I'm out. So as a new church family, remember, the Christian life is about self-denial, not self-fulfillment. And so we have to acknowledge the Christian goal, the way Jesus ended his life. He was crucified as a political failure in front of everybody, family and friends. So if your goal is to be liked, you're in the wrong faith. I think it follows. Um, So let's make this the year we grow in the Holy Spirit and the scriptures and courage to speak the truth. And finally, we're going to come to communion. Um, the fourth thing, grace and humility in how we do the truth telling, okay? Grace and humility in how we do the truth telling. This is so important, you guys. People should not be disillusioned by your church because of your personal character. Understand that. Sin needs to be confronted in love because people in Colorado Springs who are not church people should not look at the lives of fervent church people and say, what's the difference between theirs and mine? They should not be disillusioned because of your character. So we need to speak love into one another's lives and confront well. So after Stephen pokes the hornet's nest, right? He pokes the hornet, stiff-necked people, how do-? he pokes the nest. What does he say next? In verse 60, once they start killing him, Verse 60, the last verse of chapter 7, he says, Then he fell on his knees as he's dying by their hand, and he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. So Stephen, see the tension. He goes right for the jugular vein, and then when they turn around in arrogance and bring down the hammer, he's like, God, forgive them. They don't know. They don't know. Forgive them. This is the tension. Most people are one or the other. Some people love to fight to the bitter end and get the last word in or whatever. But here's a guy who picks a fight out of conviction based on the scriptures filled with the Holy Spirit, but he's willing out of humility to lay his life down at the last moment. 
This is the thing our culture needs now more than ever, courage and humility at the same time. If anything our culture needs to see in 2021 from the church who represents Jesus in America after all the craziness of 2020, if there's anything America as a whole needs to see from Jesus' body in America, it's courage to speak truth wrapped in self-sacrificial love that is radically self-denying. This is what the world needs to see. And I think it's extremely interesting. You see Jesus at the end giving Stephen a standing ovation. Normally in the scriptures, whenever you see Jesus at the right hand of the Father, he's seated. But here Jesus standing, he's like, let's go. He's like, come on, my guy. Look at that, look at my guy. Look what he's doing. Look how he did it, he did it. He did all the things that I did. Jesus gives him a standing ovation. So say hello to the first Christian martyr in the church. The dude who walked in on a Sunday and now volunteers to wait tables for the elderly. This is who the first martyr of the church is. 10% of the book of Acts. 10% of the first church history book ever written devoted to Stephen. So how can we take this and really process this? How can we live this, you guys? One of the keys, I think, for children of the info age like we are, everything's instant, everything's fast, right? We skip through our YouTube commercials every five seconds. We want everything going fast. One of the keys to this, you guys, I think is breaking through boredom. I don't know how many of you expected me to go there. I think one of the keys to spiritual growth today as an act of resistance against consumerism and pace and noise and vitriol and division is is being alone with God and breaking through boredom. My kids say to my wife and I all the time, like, Mom, Dad, we're bored. I'm like, no, you're boring. (laughs) You live in San Diego. Like, go outside now. (laughs) Like, it's not boring here. You're in California. If you're bored and you live right here in downtown San Diego and it's sunny and it's 72, December 15th or whatever degrees, like, you're the problem if you're bored. (laughs) Not whatever else is around you. And so it's amazing to me that we become bored. We become bored. There's so much going on. So many things you can do online and courses and classes and school and whatever. It's fascinating time we live in, but we are trivial. I don't know about you. I tend to be addicted to the trivial. When I get bored, I tend to medicate my boredom with trivial things. I'm really bored right now. I'm going to go binge The Crown on Netflix or whatever. I'm going to watch Queen Elizabeth and Diana. I'm just going to binge. It's going to be amazing. I feel like I'm alone in that almost, (laughs) except for her. I feel very exposed right now. Um, There's nothing wrong with entertainment, don't get me wrong, Uh, but if you take that boredom, and instead of saying, what do you want to do? What do you want to fill this with? Instead of saying that, what if you just said, hey, let's, let's have some ministry. Let's invite the Holy Spirit into this moment, wherever we are. Let's invite the Holy Spirit right now. Imagine you're sitting at home and someone's like, hey, why don't we hold hands right now and ask the Holy Spirit to come in glorious power in this room? Just see what happens. Anything can happen. Let's see what he does and how our minds shift onto whatever the real thing is God is doing in our lives that week. Um, or what if you said, hey, you know, I, I, have, I have free hours this week. I'm going to download a course called Finding Jesus in the Old Testament from biblicaltraining.org. It's free, and it's awesome, and they're high-level Bible teachers, and it's courses. you get. I'm going to deepen my life in Christ. Um, that's amazing. So the point, that moment of boredom, how many of you have ever had a moment of boredom in the last month. Solid half, some of us don't even remember what it's like to be bored and we need to be bored. Some of us have bored our, medicated our boredom so much that we just need to be bored again. That tends to be me. In the ministry, it's hard to be bored. Too, too many people to call and too many people to hear back from and feedback, positive, negative to receive on myself or whatever. I need to be bored. I need to sanctify boredom, call it Sabbath, and just be. That's a moment for spiritual growth. All the things that matter are buried below boredom. All the breakthroughs are right there. You will never sensationalize. We had a great night of worship last night, you guys, but we, we, you will never night of worship yourself towards spiritual growth. Understand. 
Those are incredible wells to drink from, but unless you know how to dig one, you'll never leave it. So uh, how do we do that without it being like a beat down? Um, if you commute 15 minutes a day, you can listen to audio courses. You can ask the Holy Spirit to come into your vehicle. It literally is lit like Brother Lawrence says, practicing the presence of God. Um, I'm sure Garrett and Bethany have a million ways that fit all of our lives where we can grow in intimacy with Jesus, Holy Spirit, Scripture, courage to speak truth, but wrapped in self-sacrificial humility. I think that's going to create the kind of church life that will meet 2021 head on and blow away Colorado Springs. Um, that's, that's my dream for San, our church in San Diego. I know it's the Groppner's dream for this church in Colorado Springs. And if you want it, it's like you can have it. Holy Spirit's here. And so we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come afresh right now into this room. And Garrett's going to lead us in communion. And so I think I, I do a song, and then you're going to do communion. So if you could, just, just take a deep breath and maybe close your eyes. We're going, to start, we're going to start with prayer. Start the communion time with prayer. And know that the Holy Spirit loves to be invited by his kids. He's both omnipresent and appreciates an invitation. The church has been saying, Holy Spirit, come for thousands of years. Holy Spirit, would you come? We don't want you to baptize our opinions. We want you to baptize our minds and give us the mind of Christ. For love, joy, peace, patience, where that just, we literally become content in those things. I'm so far. We confess to you our distance from self-control. We're not close to self-control in many ways. We're not close to patience. We're not close to joy. But we realize you're close to us. So just take 20 seconds and just say thank you for him being close and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal ways that you can redeem your boredom. And then we'll sing.